At number 10 we have Spongebob is satanic. You mean that little square dude who just wants to love everyone and is nice to every last person he meets? Well not just him but the whole show. There's a theory floating around that the whole show has satanic undertones and is trying to convert kids into worshipping satan. There's a few episodes that conspiracy theories have dissected and pulled out some questionable bits and pieces but they're all pretty far fetched. The backbone of this theory is the fact that Spongebob was originally supposed to be an animated show for adults and the 7 main characters characters represent the 7 deadly sins. Let me break this down for you like a fat kid who sat down too fast. First we have Mr. Krabs who is obviously greed. If you've seen the show one time there's no need for me to explain that all he cares about is money. Next we have Plankton who is envy. His entire existence is about how he wants his restaurant the chum bucket to be better than his competitors restaurant the Krusty Krab. He is extremely envious. Maybe don't name your restaurant the chum bucket if you're trying to have people enjoy the themselves. Sandy is clearly pride, her love of Texas is displayed in almost every episode she's in. Patrick is clearly sloth, he spends most of the early episodes just lying around and he is a starfish which is a naturally slow and docile animal. Squidward is rat, constantly getting angry at Spongebob and almost killing him on a couple of occasions. Gary is gluttony, this one is a little harder to notice but almost every time Spongebob talks about Gary he says I gotta feed Gary. There's even an episode where Gary abandons Spongebob all because Patrick has a cookie in his pocket. And finally we have Spongebob and the only sin left is lust. Now Spongebob certainly isn't trying to have sex with a bunch of people on the show, it's obvious that's, that's not happening. He's not a Jessica Rabbit type figure, he's not very sexual. Also the crossover between Jessica Rabbit and Spongebob is enough to give a war veteran nightmares. And now because I said it, someone on the internet is drawing it. But realistically Spongebob loves everyone, he's trying to make everyone happy and is quick to show everyone his never dying affection. This is why he is lust and the whole show might be about worshipping the devil, whoa. At number 9 we have the Teletubbies are slaves. Oh yeah this just keeps getting darker. The Teletubbies never get to decide anything in their strange drug trip of a world. They have a narrative voice that will talk to them and tell them what to do even when they don't want to do it. They have a pinwheel that spins and sprays them with some sort of dust which causes them to go to sleep. It kind of seems like a mind control drug. And then there's that giant face that floats in the sky constantly watching them like the eye of Sauron. It is a baby but it is still terrifying. The whole situation has the feeling of something pulled right out of George Orwell's 1984. Maybe the show's hypnotizing kids to believe that a life of orders and surveillance is okay, but that's a theory for another list. At number 8 we have Dr. Claw and Inspector Gadget are one in the same. The goofy cartoon Inspector Gadget has a clumsy cyborg detective stumbling through cases aided by his niece and his dog. The villain of the series is the faceless Dr. Claw who remains a mystery to the viewer for the entire show. Speculation suggests the reason the arch enemy of Inspector Gadget never reveals himself to the audience is because he is in fact Inspector Gadget himself. Not the exact same guy, but the original. It's implied that Inspector Gadget is a cyborg, being mostly human with some cybernetic upgrades. What if he was all robot and put in place to replace the real Inspector Gadget who was thought to have died in an accident, but the original didn't die in the accident, became Dr. Claw and wanted revenge on the police force that put him in the situation that nearly killed him. The accident would explain the creepy voice and the crippled arm that is always reaching out when it's all covered in metal. Hmm, maybe. At number 7 we have Charlie Brown has cancer. Oof, this is a dark one. I never said this was going to be a happy list. Let's start with the visuals. He's got no hair. And it's not because he's too young. Many of the other peanut characters are rocking full heads of hair. There's also the fact that he's always sad. This could be because he knows what the future holds for him. Even though he gets to hang out with his friends, the future seems pretty bleak if you know your time is limited. Also, all the adults talk in that womp 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 language. This could be Charlie Brown blocking them out because every time an adult talks to him, it's all related to his terminal condition. Or that adults are talking in medical terms that he doesn't understand. Understand. Either way, this is a pretty dark theory about Charlie Brown, which uh, I hope isn't true. At number 6 we have Scooby Doo takes place during the Great Depression. Why else would every business owner, mayor and dude living next to a costume shop be trying to fool people into thinking they are monsters so they can make away with huge profits? It's because there's no damn jobs. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Plus back in the 30s at least 80% more people believed in ghosts which is like a totally true statistic I just made up. Which made a plan of someone dressing up as a creature for profit more believable. Could you imagine pitching that plan as a criminal today. So how do you guys want to rob the bank? We're going to use guns or we could dress up as spooky things and scare the money out of the bank. At number 5 we have Winnie the 
who links to mania. This is similar to the Spongebob theory that every one of the main characters represents every one of the seven deadly sins. This theory suggests that Pooh and his friends individually represent different mental disorders. Let's start with the obvious one. Eeyore is depression. This dude never smiles and it's impossible to get a laugh out of the guy. Piglet has a brutal case of anxiety. I mean his catchphrase is oh dear. I don't think he ever stops worrying. Rabbit has OCD. The owl is dyslexic. Tigger is jumping around bouncing off the walls with his ADHD. And finally the star of the show Winnie the Pooh is Compulsive. You don't spend all day seeking out enough honey to pack up a supermarket if you have great self control. At number four, the Teletubbies are linked to Harry Potter. We have more Teletubby theories to throw on this list. Honestly, I've never seen an episode of Teletubbies, but I've come across a couple of these theories and I feel that they shouldn't be ignored because they are so outrageous. So each Teletubby has a symbol on top of its head. One of them is the lightning bolt, which is of course the symbol that is on Harry Potter's forehead. And the other three Teletubbies have a circle, a triangle, and a line. Combine these symbols and make what? The symbol for the Deathly Hollows. Whoa! What does this mean? I really have no idea. I mean, it could mean that the Teletubbies were former wizards from the Harry Potter universe that were exiled to another universe because they practiced the dark arts. And now that's why they live in this world controlled by outside forces because they were formerly super powered wizards that are now prisoners and they are forced to be in these forms so they can't escape and then take over the world. I am deep in the Kool Aid on this one. At number three, we have their eating Pokemon. When directly asked about eating Pokemon, the developers of the games have always dodged the question, but there are several instances that point towards everyone in the Pokemon world eating Pokemon. For instance, the Pokemon Farfetch'd. In its backstory, it says the reason that they are so rare is because they were hunted almost to extinction. Also in the anime, there is more than one occasion where we see Pokemon deep fried or sliced and diced. And honestly, it's not that crazy. Some Pokemon fans freak out at the idea of people eating Pokemon in the Poke universe because Pokemon are supposed to be your companions. Companions, but it's not all that different from what we do in real life. There are some animals like cats and dogs that we have claimed as pets and we will not eat them ever. And there are other ones that we give the factory farm treatment to. I'm sure it's the same in their world. You eat the ones you can't win battles with and then you probably befriend the ones that are made out of rock because you can't eat them. And number two, we have Courage the Cowardly Dog is hallucinating. By far, this is one of my favorite cartoons of all time. It's so strange, the art style is one of the best of its era, and its main character is a dog just trying to be a good boy. Come on, that's amazing. What more could you ask for? But what if all the strange monsters, ghosts, and intruders that Courage is seeing in every episode weren't even there? What if they're all hallucinations? This could either be some sort of drug trip from his owners giving him some sort of medication, or because he has little doggy schizophrenia. I don't know if dogs get mental disorders, but if it was true, I guess this could be the case. There is also the theory that this is how Courage sees the world, which is very depressing. Seeing monsters 24-7 would be very stressful. And for the number one spot, we have the Smurfs are white supremacists. Holy cow, this is a wild one, but there is a decent amount of evidence. I'm not saying watch this video and then destroy all your Smurf collectibles because they represent a hate group. I'm just throwing these dumb theories out there and then you do what you want. But you might look at the little blue creatures a little differently after this. So first off, there's the obvious point that they're all wearing little white suits with little white caps. On top of this, their leader is the only one who doesn't wear white, but he wears red and he also practices magic. Well, the leader of the KKK dresses in all red and he's called the Grand Wizard. And if that's not enough for you, it's thought that their main enemy is supposed to be a Jewish man. His cat is even named after the Jewish angel of death. So are the Smurfs racist? I don't know, maybe they were created back in 1958. I feel like racism grew on trees back then. Starting off the countdown, we have Dora the Witch. Now, what can explain the fact that Dora has talking inanimate objects? Well, it may just be because it's a kid's show, or maybe it's because she's actually a witch that can conjure up spells. That one's far more interesting. Now, one of the spells is placed on the backpack and the map so that they can help her along the way. In fact, she's trying to recruit children into witchhood as well. She needs the children's help in order to conjure the spells by chanting along with her. That's why she has those chants, like chanting backpack, backpack to receive the item that she needs. Now, it is said that she also has placed a spell on Swiper. The spell is Swiper No Swiping. When she says that, Swiper will fail to take the item. If he does succeed to take the item, then he always will have to throw it away. So this spell ensures that Swiper can never truly steal anything. Coming in at number 9, we have Dora Suffers from Dementia. 
duh duh Dora, more like duh duh dementia. So Dora is said to suffer from extreme short term memory loss, kind of like Drew Barrymore in the movie Fifty First Dates. She's stuck doing the same things every day, and to her, it feels new. But the audience can see the daily repetition of her life, and she's constantly going to be stuck acting and thinking like a child, even when she ages. Now, throughout the episodes, Dora will ask the audience for help, and then pause for an uncomfortable amount of time, just staring into your soul. In fact, there are no audiences in her world. She is just talking to herself, and that's how long it takes her brain to process new information. Coming in next at number 8, we have Boots is a Trapped Child. Now, if the previously mentioned theory is correct and Dora is a witch, then people believe that Boots is actually a child that she has trapped and turned into a monkey type creature. Kind of like how Yzma turned Cusco into a llama in Emperor's New Groove. So first off, Boots can talk. And secondly, he literally wears boots. If he was a real monkey with opposable type thumbs on his feet, then wearing boots would be extremely uncomfortable. That means that this child is a monkey but still has some of his human features. That's why he can talk and walk normally. Boots is then stuck being Dora's assistant for eternity. Moving on to number 7, we have Dora is in a coma. People believe that Dora is actually in a coma and is imagining everything that is shown in the show. But how did this happen? Well, people theorize that Dora was home alone one day when robbers decided to break into her house. As a result, she ended up getting attacked by these robbers and ended up in a coma. In fact, Swiper is actually a reference to one of the robbers that attacked her. That's why Swiper is always around Dora and stealing items, because her last memory was of her attacker. So now Dora is living in a dreamlike world until she wakes up from her coma. People theorize that she never will be able to, until her parents pull the plug. In our sixth spot, we have Swiper is a human. Now, people believe that Swiper was actually a man who then got turned into a fox. So this theory surrounds the idea that Swiper was once a poor peasant. He wasn't the nicest man, and as a result for his bad behavior, Dora punished him by turning him into a fox. Now, why would Swiper constantly want to steal items but not keep them? Because he just always throws them away right after. Seems like a complete waste of time. Well. What if Dora's backpack holds the potion to turn Swiper back into a human? Now, that would make sense to why he's always following Dora around. He's just waiting for the opportunity to sneak into her backpack and get the potion. He may steal those other items to distract Dora until he has a chance to get what he truly wants. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the cursed backpack. Now, Dora's backpack looks completely harmless. It's literally a bag with a face on it that sings. But Turns out the backpack has a darker agenda. So people are convinced that Dora's backpack is actually cursed. They say that it's some sort of enchanted artifact, maybe even cursed by an old spirit. Like it has the ability to summon a variety of different objects just from a little backpack. Either that or it has the extension charm from Harry Potter cast on it. But anyways, this bag always supplies Dora with a variety of items. Some are useful, while others are said to just be a distraction. The bag is constantly testing Dora's worthiness. If she chooses the wrong item in a bad situation, then Dora could end up dying. But honestly, I think that this is pretty funny. Like in one of the episodes, Backpack asks which item is good to put on boots, scraped knee, and then they give you options like rope, a band aid, an umbrella, scissors. Like, yeah, just I'm gonna take the umbrella and put it on the cut. And it's kind of funny. In our fourth spot, we have the theory that Dora has schizophrenia. Dora spends her days roaming around, going on adventures that she is completely making up. But she's convinced that everything she sees is all real. This includes a blue bull, a light purple and yellow monkey, and a giant red chicken. Ever notice why the animals are all unusually colored? Well, it's because Dora is delusional. She imagines that her town is a rainforest and that she can talk to animals and inanimate objects. In fact, Boots is said to be one of her doctors. He follows Dora around observing her behavior and makes sure that she doesn't get into any trouble. But Dora imagines Boots as a monkey that wears boots. Dora is also never seen going to school. Well, that's because her case of schizophrenia is so severe that she can't go to school. 
Moving on at number three, we have Dora is suffering from a terminal illness. Poor Dora, apparently she hasn't got a lot more time to live. So this theory revolves around the idea that Dora is very sick and her adventures are all in her imagination. So Dora is said to be so sick that she isn't allowed to leave her house. She suffers from an illness that causes a child to be born with a big head, which explains why Dora's head is unusually large. Now as a result of her sickness, she isn't allowed to leave her home. The adventures that she goes on are just the stories that she makes up from playing with her toys. Her toys are a stuffed animal fox and a monkey and the doll that she considers herself. She wishes that she can be adventurous and brave so she just created this doll as someone who she wants to be. Now she made her stuffed animal fox the personification of her illness because her illness is literally swiping away years of her life. In our second spot we have Dora is an undercover spy. Hard to believe that this little 8 year old girl could be a spy but there are a lot of reasons why people believe it. So people believe that this show takes place in the 1960s. This was during the Cold War when there was the whole Cuban Missile Crisis. Now people believe that Dora is assigned to find out information on the nuclear missiles in Cuba. Dora, as in D-O-R-A, is said to stand for Designated Operative Recon Agent. Now Dora is always seen on specific established paths. She never actually explores unknown locations. That's because she already knows where she needs to go. And her talking map? Well, it's a reference to her GPS that is guiding her where to go. And then we have the monkey boots. Well, boots is a reference to the military term boots on the ground. It refers to the individuals who are currently fighting in a war zone. Nice try, Dora, but we figured out your true identity. And in our number one spot, we have Demon Swiper. So of course one of the most well known characters is Swiper the Fox. Every episode he gives Dora a hard time, steals her items and then throws them away. And of course you have the famous line, Swiper no swiping. Now people have a theory that Swiper is actually a demon. They believe that he is an evil spirit in a form of a fox that's goal is to cause chaos on earth. In fact people have made the connection between Swiper and the story of Life of Leoba by Rodolf Folda. In this story a nun loses the church key and feels guilty for being negligent. However, the head nun believes that it was stolen by a swiper demon. Eventually, they find a dead fox at the church door with the key in his mouth. They say that Satan had transformed himself into a fox and had stolen the keys. They ended up defeating him by praying. Okay, so who else do we know that is a fox that steals? Swiper. That means the phrase, swiper no swiping, is a command that repels swiper so he can't steal. Therefore, Swiper is a demon. Starting this list, often at number 10, the original idea of the show was actually so traumatic that it drove people to drug abuse. The Magic School Bus was initially meant to be, you know, a kid's horror show that was similar to Are You Afraid of the Dark? I, I can't really see this. Originally, the show was called Horror is Alive, and the entire first scene was already written. But apparently, the scenes from the show were so traumatic that some of the people working on the project started to abuse illegal drugs. Oh, and get this. The original writer, director, committed arson, and that's to make sure that the written season was never seen by anyone. So he burned down all of the material that was created for the show. I mean, what the heck did they write? I'm a little bit curious to the original script of the Back of School Bus. Miss Frizzle is a wizard, and this fan theory takes us to number nine. Apparently, Miss Frizzle must either be some sort of powerful wizard or psychic because she always manages to stay calm and get the class out of like any life-threatening events that they always seem to be in every episode. Some people even believe that she went to Hogwarts School of Magic, but then she dropped out because she was failing. Maybe that explains why her field trips are, you know, sometimes disastrous, and oftentimes we see the kids facing some pretty dangerous scenarios. Maybe the Frizz needs to go back to wizard school so that she can relearn, you know, the fundamentals. Number eight, Miss Frizzle was basically a child abductor. Think about it for a minute. Miss Frizzle told the parents that she would be taking them on, you know, innocent field trips. Sometimes she says that she was taking them to the zoo or the planetarium, when in reality, she was taking them to outer space or Antarctica. If you were these parents, wouldn't you be super upset? I know I would be. She's lying to these parents and taking them on these crazy field trips where they have an 88% chance of dying or losing a limb. 
I mean, she's exposed them to radiation, hypothermia, and some other pretty intense situations. I bet the majority of the time, she didn't even get the permission slips from the parents. Or maybe like she's forging them herself. It seems like she kidnapped them during the day and made sure that they were back when school was over. I mean, what's stopping her from kidnapping all of these kids and never coming back? I mean, the police would never be able to find her. Miss Frizzle is basically the Tony Stark of her time, and this takes us to number seven. To us, the school bus and all of these field trips seem to be magic. But really, they are just advanced technologies and robotics that are being used to alter mass, space, and time. Not only did she engineer a super futuristic and a high-tech school bus, she was also able to confer to the mind of an ordinary lizard to have the same intelligence as a dog. We think that she became a school teacher so that she can ward off suspicion from others. If anyone knew the truth, the government would want to confiscate her work and reverse engineer it. And after all, who would really believe crazy stories coming from six or seven year olds? I mean, the answer is nobody. That's why she was able to get away with all of this for such a long time. Now at number six, where are Arnold's parents? It's no secret that Arnold always appeared sad or unwilling to participate in adventures with his friends. He was always a loner and was always super cautious. Well, as it turns out, he might have been abused or neglected by his parents. In the episode titled Go Cellular, he talks about how he's eating nothing but seaweed for the past month. I'm not an expert or anything, but that sounds like his parents are never around or they just don't care about Arnold. It sounds like he's being super malnourished and it seems like he doesn't get the love and support that he needs from home home. Miss Frizzle and all of the kids were high on drugs and this insane theory that might be plausible takes us to number five. Apparently Miss Frizzle should have lost her teaching license a very long time ago because every day that she showed up for work, well, she was either high or on some pretty intense drugs. She turned her Maxi school bus into a hot box and whenever she took the kids on a field trip, well, she would hot box the heck out of those kids. Think about it for a second. All of those crazy field trips can never happen happen in real life, right? But it could happen in the drug life. Miss Frizzle is actually a patient in an insane asylum, and this dark theory brings us to number four. It's been suggested that our beloved teacher, Miss Frizzle, is actually locked in an insane asylum where the students and all of the adventures they go on are the results of her psychosis and mental breakdowns. The theory goes on to say that she was actually a teacher, but her disobedient students and the stress from her job actually caused her to go through a midlife crisis so she is being placed in an institution, you know, for her own protection. They are constantly giving her strong drugs that leave her in a catatonic state. So all of these field trips are just a result of her memories from being a teacher mixing with her psychosis. Next up, number three, Arnold died in the first episode. Poor Arnold, he was always forced to go on these elaborate field trips or do these things that he wasn't comfortable doing. And this time, he got a lot more than he bargained for because, well, apparently, the first episode, he died. I mean, it could have been episode one and the season's done. Well, he died when he tried to remove his helmet in space. Take a look at this. You're stuck! Arnold! No! Oh, no! Is this real life right now? I, I don't know. Maybe Arnold should have read the fine print on his permission slip. Or better yet, Miss Frizzle should have taught them some common sense and to never remove their helmet while in space. Number two, the kids are being sexually abused. This theory is pretty dark, and I'm sorry if I ruined your childhood for you, but doing the research ruined my childhood. There are a bunch of episodes where the kids go on field trips and witness multiple species during their reproductive time. Take for example the episode from season one called Going Upstream. There's your answer, Carlos. What? Is he some sort of car wash? No. Don't eggs have to be fertilized by the males before they can grow and hatch? The kids are converted into miniature size and they're put into salmon eggs. Later on, you can see that the male salmon ejaculates on the eggs while the kids are still in there. So what if these kids were actually being sexually abused on field trips and they just come up with these wild stories, you know, as a way to cover up from the trauma and their parents never believe them. 
Ms. Frizzle is a cold-blooded murderer, and this takes us to number one. All right, so it's speculated that Ms. Frizzle is involved with a top-secret organization who built and manufactured a magic school bus. Ms. Frizzle would take her students on crazy field trips so that she can test their endurance and strength. The weaker students would be brutally murdered, while the remaining students would be taken to a secret laboratory to have their minds erased. The organization and Ms. Frizzle would teach these kids to be cold-blooded murderers who were trained to take control over Earth. This would explain why her class was so small. Not everyone made it out alive. Starting us off at number 10 are genetically engineered slaves. Nowhere in the show do we ever find out where the Teletubbies come from, where they are, how they got there, absolutely nothing. The only thing we do know is that they aren't in control of their own destiny. They're controlled by three factors. The first is the voice, which is the maternal voice that blasts from the speakers below them and tells them when they should eat, when they should say goodbye, and when they should sleep. And since this voice is there in every episode, it's clear that something bigger than the show is monitoring the Teletubbies and what they're doing. The second factor controlling them is Nunu, the anthropomorphic vacuum cleaner that literally follows them around, cleaning up after them, and then scolding them when they make bad decisions. That's what Nunu is on the surface, but really it's more of a watchdog and the tool used by whoever put the Teletubbies there to control them. The final thing is the mysterious godhead wind peel that the Teletubbies worship. Whenever it spins, the Teletubbies drop whatever they're doing and run to the hill and perform a ritual for the gods, trying to be the only one that's favoured. The one that gets chosen has their genetically implanted TV screen activated and it's seen as a reward because they're the Teletubby that gets to deliver the message to the other ones. The screen itself shows an indoctrination video showing the world of man and how one day the Teletubbies are going to serve us. Now we come on to the sun baby. It's something the Teletubbies won't fear, they understand it, and they like like the baby, but really, the baby is just hiding the Teletarian eyes that watch them from the outside. Either way, it's clear that the Teletubbies are cut off from outside influence and are being controlled and courted into becoming our slaves. Quite sad when you think about it that way. Coming in at number 9 is their height. Now on the show, the Teletubbies look like cute pine sized creatures who you low key just want to cuddle, but it turns out they're not little at all, they're gigantic. The whole group ranges from being 6 foot 7 to 7 foot 11 in real life. They'd be gargantuan in real life, bigger than Barney, and Barney was massive, and even bigger than Big Bird. Tinky Winky is 7 foot 11, Dipsy and Lala are both 7 foot, and Poe is 6 foot 7. Which makes the whole show just a lot more sinister because they went from miniature cute creatures to ones that tower over you and pummel you if they wanted to. Their costumes weigh more than 30 pounds, and there's actually a danger of carbon dioxide buildup in the suit if performers have them on for too long. So, moral of the story, the Teletubbies are sinister, massive, of giants that could very well kill you. And after now knowing how big they were, then you may also want to know that the rabbits in Teletubby Land were also bloody massive to try and look like normal sized rabbits next to the Teletubbies. The end. Enjoy your day. At number 8 we have the homes. The show is filmed in this luscious Greenland area where the grass is never not green and the sun is always there. A utopia if you will, but not anymore. Rosemary Harding, the owner of the land where the exterior shots were taken, got so fed up and angry with the amount of trespassers that would come to her house because they wanted to see where the show took place and whatnot, as she couldn't take it anymore. People used to jump her fences, cross the cattle fields, just have no respect for the area whatsoever. So she ended up flooding the whole thing and turning it into a giant pond so no one would bother her again. Bit savage, I'm not gonna lie. And I feel like that's just like an end of an era, like there's never gonna be Tai Tubby shot there again. It's done, it's gone, it's a pond now. Filling a number 7 slot is the Harry Potter crossover. No, there was never a massive Harry Harry Potter and Teletubbies crossover that you missed, but Emma Lord theorized that JK Rowling was inspired by watching the Teletubbies. So the show first aired in 1997, and two months later, the first Harry Potter book came out. Now just imagine JK watching Harry Potter with her daughter, and yes, I know the first episode aired after she had completed the first draft, but her first drafts can always be changed. But it was actually Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows where the crossover came to fruition. According to Emma, Lala was the best Teletubby, so Harry Potter is Lala. Then comes Tinky Winky as the invisibility cloak because apparently no one cared about Tinky Winky, which in Tinky Winky's defense is very harsh. Someone had to be the oldest of the group, we can't hate him for it. Anyway, next comes Dipsy as the elder one because Dipsy was always screwing things up at home and is the most stubborn one of the group, and let's face it, the elder one was pretty problematic. Last but not least comes cute little Poe as a resurrection stone.
alone. Despite her being the youngest of the group, she clearly had the hunger to live forever. And there you have it guys, the crossover is complete. Utterly ridiculous, I know, but perhaps plausible. Now at number 6 is Tubby Custard. Honestly, I used to love watching them eat Tubby Custard or throw it around. It looks so good, I just wanted to devour it. Or maybe because I'm fasting right now, I'm finding it very appetizing when it really wasn't. But anyway, Redditor Poob spelt with a Q has quite an interesting theory about what Tubby Custard even is. It doesn't have the same colour or texture as custard, so clearly it isn't proper custard. It looks sort of like liquefied chewing gum, so the user theorised the Hoover chews many packets of gum all at once and then separates them into four even moulds while the Teletubbies are outside. If that doesn't tickle your fancy, the user came up with another theory. He went on to discuss a theory about how sometimes the government uses cartoons to promote unhealthy eating practices, so what if Tubby Custard was the pink fake meat from McDonald's? The meat there is just random bits of chicken blended together becoming pink from leftover blood. And the kids watching the show obviously wouldn't know the difference, so it would subliminally promote the message of eating things like that. Coming in at number 5 is the demon face. So I'm sure everyone watching the video has watched the show, but if you haven't, the baby sun appears in every episode and it rises during the intro. We've all seen it, there's nothing new there. But one user decided to watch it late at night one day just because he was bored, which I mean fair enough, we all love a bit of nostalgia. But he realised about 20 seconds in, right before the baby sun disappears, it morphed into a demonic form or shape. Now it wasn't that oh while the screen was stretching out the sun just started looking strange, no, it morphed into something and then stretched and disappeared. Thinking maybe it was just late and he was tired and saw something that wasn't there, he decided to watch another video to confirm. And it was there again, he watched another one and it was there again as well. And now I'm like what's up with that? Why does a children's show have subliminal images of horror inside of it that's being fed to young children via Teletubbies? The user went on to digest the episode even more and realised most of the episodes have an endlessly spinning windmill that he reckons mirrors hypnotic imagery. Children's minds really aren't as developed as ours and so it's easy for their minds to get manipulated watching something rather than ours. Maybe your child doesn't just love the Teletubbies and wants to watch it every day, maybe they were subliminally hypnotised into liking it. What say you? At number 4 is Seesaw. So funnily enough, an episode titled Seesaw ended up getting banned from being aired because of parents and kids complaining about how creepy and scary it was. The episode features the lion and the bear. The scary lion has big scary teeth and both animals were made out of wood and travelled around on skateboard looking things rather than being animated. The episode gained a lot of controversy because the animals looked too uncanny. They had weird eyes, weird ears, they moved on their own, they spoke in scary voices and ultimately they were just too much for the audience. At the end of the episode there's even a chase sequence and it traumatised some kids so much that they started suffering from anxiety. It's kind of like us watching a chase sequence in Planet Earth when we're really just rooting for the prey except it was kids watching a lion chase a bear. And I can see how that could have been scary but also they were wooden for god's sake how scary could it have really been. Filling our number 3 slot is The Comeback. So this article by the Sydney Morning Herald was published in 2014 and it was about the show's comeback. It's not surprising a comeback happened because the show was iconic back in the day and everyone liked it but it did end in 2001 and TV has changed dramatically since then. The producer of DHX Media, Stephen Denure, said the show depicts them interacting with technology in an indirect way. I mean they have TVs on their bellies, their best friend is a vacuum cleaner, etc. But many claim the show encourages kids to play with technology more instead of going outside and playing. A US televangelist back in the day even said Tinky Winky was a concealed gay role model because he carried a handbag and was encouraging homosexuality amongst young kids who didn't even know what it was yet. Leave the man's handbag alone, what's wrong with the handbag? It was fashion forward, good going Tinky Winky. Anyway, critics also said the show's dialogue is mostly sing song and is barely verbal communication which is damaging to an audience that's still learning how to speak. So there was a very nasty fight between TV consultants arguing against the show's comeback as unnecessary and damaging to the youth. Now at number 2 are the Tiddly Tubbies. So if you don't know there's actually a Tiddly Tubbies spin off series that started airing in 2015 and it's called Tiddly Tubbies. And yes, the Tiddly Tubbies are the kids of the original four. There are 8 Tiddly Tubbies living in the home dome with the original four and their names are Ba, Ping, Mimi, Umbi, Pumbi, Dada, Nin and Duggle D. They all have their own colours and quite honestly they're actually really really cute. But when people found this out they were shook. First of all, most audience members thought all four Teletubbies were guys. Second of all, they didn't even know they could have intercourse. I mean, I mean, how do they even do it? Who, who did it with who? You can kind of guess by the colours of the Tiddly Tubbies. One of them is orange, so I'm guessing that was Poe and Lala's doing, even though they're both girls. So like, how? I don't think adoption is a thing where they live, so people have actually theorised they have intercourse 
intercourse from the appendages on their head. I have no idea which goes in what and what the process is, but I'm willing to go with it. And finally, at number one is the backstory. Scarlet Siren claims she found out the backstory of the show and it's horrific, long, but it's worth it. The show was based on a mental institute in Bulgaria nicknamed La La Land. The children inside were treated horribly. They were abused, locked in cold dark rooms, carers would forget to feed them. It was it was bad. And each Teletubby was based on a group of kids that all died on the same day. First was a girl called Lala. She had a facial deformity that stretched her face so it looked like she was permanently smiling. She was locked away and isolated for five years so her mind had just basically gone. She would dance in her room with no music, would mutter gibberish because she couldn't speak a word of Bulgarian, and she turned quite yellow because of zero exposure to the sun. Yet she was always smiling, even when abused, even when her legs broke and she couldn't dance, all the time. And this of course was the inspiration behind Lala. Another kid called Towo Te was seven at the time and would spend all his time rocking back and forth and speaking gibberish as well. He was deaf and he also had a similar facial deformity as Lala which meant he too was smiling all the time. He was the most stubborn of the lot, he used to hit his head against the wall until the stone chipped off so the carers used to tie him to the fences outside. They left him there so frequently and for so long he'd get frostbite often and his limbs turned bluish from the ice. This was the inspiration behind Tinky Winky. Next comes a six year old boy named Donka. He couldn't speak because no one ever taught him to and he was sick all the time. Half his life he was starved because he'd throw up anything he ever ate. He was so weak he couldn't even walk so he spent days just lying in his own vomit too sick and weak to move away. No one knew what was wrong with him and the carers never called a doctor to find out. Donka was the inspiration behind Dipsy. Last was a three year old girl called Polina who spent her whole life at the institute. She had the same deformity as the first two so she always smiled as well which horrified her parents and that's why they sent her there. One night she fell asleep near the logs for a fire and the carers threw her into it not realizing she wasn't a log. Her skin was melting, her flesh was burning, she was screaming and the carers got her out but it was far too late. Her skin was burned a raw red color and never recovered yet she still smiled and that was the inspiration behind Poe. You may be thinking this is so tragic how do these kids even live day to day life? But the only thing that made them happy with the TVs that showed them happiness and a life outside the institute. One day they realized the carers wanted to get rid of the TVs because they were far too expensive so all four formulated a plan to hide them before they could. That night when the carers weren't there they took the tiny TVs but realized they had nowhere to hide them. They decided to swallow them like they had swallowed many of their toys to hide them from the carers. The next morning the carers came into their room heaving from the heavy stench of blood. The four kids had clawed out their own stomachs and the blood stained TVs were there in the middle. Their organs were spilling out, flies were all over them, yet they were smiling. Mm -hmm.